Anjanu Ellis stars in the Lifetime TV movie, The Clark Sisters, a biopic about the famous first ladies of gospel. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Anjanu, and you you play uh, Maddie Moss Clark, the mother of the Clark Sisters. And first of all, I'm just curious how much you knew about the Clark Sisters and Maddie before signing on to the project. Uh, first of all, thank you for talking to me this morning. Good morning to you. Um, well, I had heard about Dr. Maddie when I was uh, a kid, um, and I actually knew of her before I knew who the Clark sisters were. Um, I had a friend of mine in elementary school. Her name was Tracy Grady, and she was um, in the Church of God in Christ. She was raised in Church of God in Christ. Church of God in Christ. I was raised Baptist. And so Tracy would go to these um, epic workshops that Dr. Maddie, uh, choir workshops that Dr. Maddie would hold all around the world. And um, Tracy, my friend Tracy, would go to these workshops. And so she would come back and just regale us with all these stories about Dr. Maddie, Dr. Maddie Moss Clark. Um, and she just became this sort of mythical figure to me. Um, and then, um, I mean, in the same way that, you know, I've, I've said this a couple of times, in the same way that Cinderella was, she was sort of this like fairy tale figure to me. And then um, the Clark sisters became famous with You Brought the Sunshine. And then ultimately, um, I just became a student of, of their music um, and just sort of did a deep dive into everything that I could find about them, all of their music, all the music that they did as a group, the music that they did collectively. Um, so, yeah, I would say that I'm, a, I'm, I'm not just a fan of the Clark sisters and, you know, Dr. Maddie, but I'm a, I would say that I'm a student of theirs as well. Interesting. And when you look at this character and your performance, I mean, it feels like the kind of thing you were just born to play. I mean, were you actually offered the role or did you have to audition? You know, weirdly, I know you hear uh, actors tell these stories where it just kind of came out of the blue. And mm -hmm. I was in New York doing uh, When They See Us and I just got a letter one Thursday night with um, this offer letter. And I, it was originally, I didn't understand it because it was for to play one of the daughters. And I, I just knew I'm too old for that. So I thought it was a fluke and I thought it was a mistake and someone had sent me something in error. And then uh, the next day I, um, you know, got on the phone immediately because um, I just felt like, how is it that these women figure so much into my preoccupation about music, about about women, about the church? And then I get this letter saying that I'm gonna play their mother. I just didn't believe it. It um and then, you know, it was real. It was it was real. So I didn't have to audition. So that part I didn't have to do. The work started after I got that letter. Hmm. And Maddie is such a fascinating character because she's deeply devoted to God, um, as well as her daughters, but she also pushes them pretty hard, which causes some strain. And I think this is a character that could be portrayed as a bit more two-dimensional than what we see here. So how did you find your way into Maddie Moss Clark? Well, one of the things I did just on a practical level, um, for me, I, I love working from the outside in rather than from the inside out. And the reason why I like doing that is because um, I there's they're, they're working that way gives me something that I can hold on to, that I can cling to. And so what I did was is that I just studied her. I studied her mannerisms. I, I I tried to get every piece of footage that I could find of hers. Um, and I, uh, someone found this great, great um, uh, audio of her actually conducting one of these workshops, choir workshops. So what I did from there was just play that, play that footage, play that audio over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'd wake up in the morning listening to it. I'd listen to it as I'm in hair and makeup. I would go to bed listening to it. 
um, and Saturday and Sunday, which were my days, so my days off, mm -hmm. I would listen to it. I listened to her all day, every day. And one of the things that I wanted to capture her, capture about her, you know, speaking of working from the outside in, is that she has this really raspy voice. And all of the daughters, all of the daughters have that as well. Her daughters have that as well. So um, I would try my best to get that, try my best to get that. I would scream in pillows when we would be shooting. I would go in closets I could find and scream just so I could scratch my voice to get that quality. And I never, I just never got it the way that I wanted it to get it. And there, there'll be moments, there are moments in the film where I get it, like I can hear myself and I'm like, God, I do sound like her, but it wasn't, you know, consistent. So, uh. but what I was able to work on is that this is a woman who, who, who speaks with authority and in authority at all times, right? Mm -hmm. So me, as I talk, as I'm talking to you, as we normal people talk, <laughs> um, we digress, we go on tangents, we question ourselves as we speak, even when we are certain about things, we still sort of question ourselves to make ourselves, you know, palatable to, who, to who, whomever we're talking to. But Dr. Maddie doesn't do that at all. <laughs> constantly speaks in authority. She is constantly speaking in and with authority. And when someone sort of moves through the world in that way, there's a certain rhythm to that cadence, a uh, certain placement of your voice. So that's what I try to tap into in terms of like, in terms of just the mechanics of playing her. And then on the other side of that is, um, you know, this idea of playing someone her, someone like her, and it could, like you said, easily be two dimensional. And I think one of the biggest compliments I've gotten, you know, since the the movie aired was someone sent me a a, a a screenshot of a tweet that someone did and and they said um i don't know how i feel about maddie i don't know whether to love her or hate her or adore her and that was i i was like i did something right <laughs> i did it i got it right i got it right you know to some degree i would say and i and i think that you know she she was never one thing she was never one thing ever. And what drove her was her vision for her daughters, her vision for gospel music, her vision for that church, for the Church of God in Christ and their legacy in gospel. Um, that drove her. And what irked her and made her so angry is that someone willfully choosing to be mediocre. So all of that, and you know, all of that was rooted in love. The tremendous love that she had for her daughters, the tremendous love she had for God, the tremendous love she had for church. And so what I let what I allowed to happen or try to do was just let that fly. Whatever way that, that came out, you know, I just I just I just let it fly. And I did not I did not question that. I, I every all the things that I felt that Matt Dr. Maddie did that made people feel uncomfortable. I, I, I leaned into that because for her, it was making some, making the people around her better. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so tell me about just working with these five actresses who play your daughters. What was that like on set? Because I, I can tell you, it, it really feels like a family. Yeah. I, I worked with the wonderful Raven Goodwin, who is this, wonderful accomplished actor actress uh actor from being mary jane and lovely and amazing and all these great projects that, she, that she's been a part of and then the other women were uh young women my daughters were singers uh shalea frazier angela burchett uh christina bell and kiera sheard who actually in real life is the granddaughter of dr maddie um so you know what we 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 just we worked our tails off in that in the tundra of toronto in january and february of of 2019 and the result of that is you know there was a lot of connective tissue as a result of all of that you know all of that work that we did that sort of communicated without us really having to say a whole lot 
and then it was fun, you know, and, and one of the reasons why I wanted this job so bad and I was so happy and felt like it was a cosmic God gift that I got it was that I, you know, I got to go to work and listen to the Clark sisters every day. And I was, that's why I was like, oh my God, beyond playing Dr. Maddie, which was a privilege and an honor, I got to listen to the Clark sisters music every day. And these women, I cannot say enough about how talented they are. And um, one of the great stories I think about this production is the music. And, and um, the reason I say this is that they were not, they were singing live. They were still alive. There, there was playback. They had backing tracks uh, for wide shots. But when the camera is on them, they are singing live. And there are multiple times, like the beginning, the very beginning of the, of the movie, when you have that sequence, when they are singing in the church, that's them. They're not singing over anything. They are live, and it's just a microphone. And they sound that incredible. And um, one of the Shalea Frazier says, and I agree with her, that um, the live music and the live singing is almost a character in, in the movie. It's, 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 it's incredible what they did. And this was this Christine Swanson, our wonderful director. It was her vision for that, for, for them to do that. That, you know, it's wonderful. You know, we've had seen so many performances where, you know, you have a brilliant actor who sings, who doesn't doesn't sing, and they're you know lip syncing, right? And those, those performances are brilliant. You can't, you know, they're they're undeniable. But there is something special, uh, and something to be said that is rare about having real singers, real gospel singers, real Broadway singers, in front of God and everybody, and they're just out there. And there's nothing, they have nothing to, to, there's no, you know, safety net for them. They are just singing raw and from their hearts. And you could not help but be uh, affected by that. Yeah, it's astonishing, especially when they're all together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have to ask, because I couldn't help but notice all of the incredible outfits that you wore as Maddie with, with the matching hats and everything. And it must have been just so fun to wear those. I mean, did those costumes actually help you just inhabit this very confident character? Yeah, we had some really brilliant, um, um, uh, we had a really brilliant um Costumer, costume designer Emily Patsos, and we also had this uh, 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 wonderful uh, uh, hair department head. Her name was Ethelene, and um, they really worked hard with me to work hard to kind of come up with these kind of come up with these looks. And you know, Dr. Maddie in real life had this sort of signature look where she wore her hair to the back and those glasses, right? That was sort of her signature look. And because Miss Ethelene, I call her Miss Ethelene, she's so great at what she did, she was constantly, you know, churning out more wigs, churning out more wigs, you know, try this, do this, do this. And at a certain point, I had to tell her, that's great, but in order for me to feel like I'm her and to look at a picture and to look in the mirror, especially, and see see Dr. Maddie in the mirror, I needed to have my hair pulled back with those glasses. And um, that's sort of where we kind of landed in most of the time um, in, 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 in most of the work that I did on, on the movie. But those outfits and, you know, the girls in those outfits and those flowing gowns, and they tried to, you know, recreate a lot of those live performances, they tried to recreate, they tried to recreate those looks. And, you know, I grew up in those looks. I'm from, I was raised in the Baptist church, went to church three or four times a week from the time I was three until I was 18 and went to college. So I know those looks. I know those looks. So I felt like I was just pulling, pulling on my, on, on, on my past. Well, you know, and my present as well. Um, and just kind of just allow to live in that. Yeah. And this movie was a sensation when it aired on Lifetime last month. It was the network's highest rated movie in four years, and it was very well received. What has the response been like from your end? Well, I try, I try personally not to, um, not to be aware of a lot of that stuff mm. because 
it's distracting and um you when you when you when you read a lot of things and they're great and it's wonderful you start to believe it and then it was bad you start to believe that too you know and, and so i try to just try to be really level-headed about it all um but you know i have friends and family who insist on sending me all the memes about dr maddie <laughs> um, <laughs> All, all the shoe throwing memes that are are in the world now. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 only I can avoid it, you know, only so much. But you know what was great about it is you know we all know what we're experiencing right now and in the world. And what I had hoped before it aired is that people for two and a half hours would just be distracted, mm -hmm. would just have some great distraction from everything that is worrying us, all the grief that we're all collectively experiencing right now. And I just wanted, I mean, I texted everybody and was like, you watch it, watch it, watch it. And you know, I don't do that for everything that I, everything that I do. But this, I just felt like, even if it were just the music alone, that they would get some joy out of. Um, I wanted people to watch it for that reason. And what, so what makes me happy in the response that we've gotten is that, I think that happened. I think that the people who watched it and did enjoy it just felt they were able to live in this space of music and 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 fire and and joy um, for a couple of hours. And I, I just that 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 makes me feel really good. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, since we're Gold Derby, we like to talk about awards here. And last year you received your first Emmy nomination for your performance in When They See Us. Uh, you were nominated. <laughs> yeah, you were nominated alongside Niecy Nash in the Lead Actress Limited Series category. Can you just take us back to that moment and just what it was like to be honored for that performance and for that specific project? I, it was completely unexpected for me. I mean, you know, when they see us also sort of had this cultural moment and for, diff, you know, for different reasons. And, and, and it wasn't just cultural, it was political. And, um, and the impact, you know, was, uh, you know, was a moment of corrective justice, which I just made me utterly proud to be a part of something like that, um, to be a part of that. Um, and I think that's the mission of Ava DuVernay. And when they see us was a part of that mission, personal mission of, of hers. So it was just incredible to be a part of something like that, no matter what the outcome was. And then, you know, when it aired and it got all these, you know, all these views and then, you know, a great critical response. Um, so, you know, it was just about that moment for a couple of weeks. And then I, you know, had, let it go. I had forgotten about it. I mean, I didn't forget about the, the series, of course, but I certainly wasn't thinking, you know, about me getting nominated or anything like that. I knew that there was talk about the series getting nominated, but I didn't think that I would be, you know, a part of that conversation uh, at all. And so when I was, I was driving from um, Mississippi to Georgia. I live in Mississippi, so I was driving from Mississippi to Georgia. And, you know, somebody was a friend, actually Christine Swanson, the director of the movie of Clark Sisters, texted me and she was saying congratulations. And I didn't understand why she was congratulating me. I thought she was being, you know, uh, silly. <laughs> and I was like, what are, you te what are you teasing me about? You know, like, that, that's what I thought she was doing. And then I started seeing more more of these texts coming in and I saw a text coming from Ava saying congratulations. And then so I, I, I said, let me investigate this a little bit. And so I called my manager and she, and she told me, she told me what happened. And I had to go to the gas station and I was in the gas station line and the, it was just laughing while I was buying my gum and my gas. And the man looked at me like I was stupid. I couldn't, there was no one I could turn to and say, yo, guess what happened to me today? You know? <laughs> So it was, it was, it was bizarre. I called Nisi Nash immediately. I have so much respect for, for that woman. Um, and um, so it, it was, you know, it was just, it was one of those, it was, it was a gift. It was just really was. And, and not, not, I was so grateful to be, I was thankful that I was nominated. I, I have never been nominated before, but to be nominated 
for something to as as a part of something so consequential and impactful um i was just you know tremendous tremendous for me yeah yeah uh, well, thank you so much for talking to us today, Anjanu. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Take care of yourself. Okay? I was just going to wrap up, actually. <laughs> Before, uh, for, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com to make your predictions and a whole lot more. All right. Thank you, Anjanu. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. Yes, you too.